All right, if you would please open your Bibles to the book of Micah. Yes, the book of Micah. How is everyone this morning? Wow, that was convincing. Yes, I hope you all are doing okay. It has been uh, a very crazy uh, week for us. So last week, Aubrey taught, as most of you know, and uh, I thought he did a great job. So I just want to say thank you, Aubrey, yes, for his message. And then he came to my house and decided, you know, it was time to have a baby. So I'm not sure how many of you know, but, but Aubrey's wife went into premature labor um, at our house on uh, uh, Sunday after church. So thank you, Shannon. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. We were all in, my, in our new home, and um, we were trying to get the internet going, and <laughs> it was Aubrey, uh, Ben, and I, and Shannon walks in. She goes, um, by the way, um, something just happened. And we're like, oh, no. So they went to see the midwife, and then the next day, uh, she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, and his name is Elam. You know, I don't even know what his middle name is. What's his middle name? Ira, that's right. Sorry, Ira, wherever you are. Elam, Ira, what's his last name? Just kidding. Um, and he is, he was four pounds, eight ounces, I believe. And just, he is doing well. His lungs are doing well. His heart is doing well. His skin color is getting there. It's doing really well. He's a very handsome young guy. He looks like Henley with dark hair. And um, that's his older son. And so we're just very blessed. And Shannon is doing well. She is um, healthy and doing very good. So it was a, we were very blessed. But anyways, craziness that happens over the week. So if you're Micah chapter 6, verse 8, listen, listen there are four places to mark in your Bibles this morning. Uh, I- I- Isaiah chapter 1. Do you like the way I did that? Isaiah chapter 1. Yes. Deuteronomy 6. Matthew 22 and Colossians 3. If you mark those now, we will um, turn there rather quickly uh, as we go through our study this morning. Well, as some of you know, I was involved in a pastor's prayer walk. Not just me, it was actually it was, uh, myself and Rodney and Tracy and um, Aubrey and Ben. We were all there. Um, and a pastor's prayer walk through the city of Charleston. This is back in June. The walk was organized by a couple of uh, other pastors here in the area, uh, Joe Waring, who pastors Northbridge Baptist Church in West Ashley, and Larry Goss, who pastors Destiny Worship Center um, that meets in the Charleston Baptist Association's building in North Charleston. But since that time of the prayer walk, um, the pastors have been gathering, getting together to seek the Lord on how to address racial issues in the church and and to discuss how we as the church reflect God's redemptive plan, you know, from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And Aubrey said it best last week, you know, when he said we, we shouldn't use the conversational framework of the world, rather we the church should be using the conversational framework given to us in the inspired word of God. Remember, Jesus said he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. So in the Lord's framework, we will stake our ground. So in our pastors, uh, in our area of pastors, in the last meeting that we had, uh, Pastor Craig Tuck, the missions pastor of the Charleston Baptist Association. It sounds like I'm becoming Baptist. I'm not. I just want you to know. But these are some great men. Um, Launched an initiative to have all the churches in the area teach a series from Micah 6, 8. Again, a framework for the churches to discuss these issues and speak to them. It was supposed to have happened in July, but I had some things happen, personal things that took me away. However, this is what I will be doing for the next couple of weeks. I'm going to take a break from Luke and spend some time in Micah chapter 6 addressing these issues Again, as Aubrey mentioned last week, our position has been uh, what the Spirit instructs us in James chapter 1, which is to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
And this is what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to listen to the Lord. We've been trying to listen to other people and their life experiences. And I'll tell you, uh, the meeting, uh, meeting with this mixed group of, of pastors, listening to them, and we're just, we're just getting started, has been a very powerful time. A very moving time as you hear these men who've grown up in this area and the things that they've experienced <clears throat> and their ancestors have experienced. You know, I'm, I'm of a Hispanic descent, right? My, my grandfather's from Mexico City. My mom is from her side, I am told, is from Spain. You know, I, I don't look, you know, Mexican too much. You put a snow cap on me, I look Mexican. I just want you to know. <clears throat> and, um, but, you know, I didn't grow up the way these guys did. My experience has not been this, you know. And so it's been very powerful to hear them. And uh, when I came from one of the first times that we had, I was in tears, you know, hearing what these guys have gone through and what, they, what their life is, is like. But so I've been trying to be more open, listening to, um, listening to them and, and being slow to speak. But I, listen, I'm going to speak a little now. And I think this is our time now. So uh, it's going to get a little uncomfortable, I want you to know, in here. And, uh, but I, my prayer is that you would do the same, that you would be slow to speak, that you would be slow to wrath, and that you would take everything that I'm about to say to the Word of God in prayer. Think about it, all of you online. I hope you're with me. And I, I pray you don't shut off what uh, I have to say. Take everything that I'm saying to the Word and, and pray. And... Um, and I think we need to have this discussion. We need to talk about these things and speak to these things. So the title of this weekend's message from Micah 6.8 is simply to do justly, as most of you are familiar with the scripture. So you're in Micah chapter 6. Look at verse 8. The first thing that we see in this passage is the Lord's position. He says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. So we're going to stop there. Because here we see the Lord's position and the Lord's action. Again, the Lord says, He has shown, O oh man, He has shown mankind, specifically the nation of Israel in the context of the book and of the life at this time, what is good. He has shown them what is good. In other words, God has not been silent, He has not kept man in the dark. God has been very forthcoming and open about His expectations. He's been very open and forthcoming about his commandments. And in the process, God has been very kind. He's been very gracious. He has given us life. He has given us a beautiful planet to live on. He's created wonderful things for us to enjoy, the, the plants and, and animals. He's given us an ocean. He's given us stars to, to uh, illuminate the, the, uh, the night uh, the sky at night, and for us to take delight in. I, I believe the Lord has amazing plans for the stars. But, you know, the psalmist says in Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And then he says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. Right, what a beautiful thing to, to sit out at night and just to see and just to be in awe of God. It should direct us towards worshiping the, the creator. In Psalm 19, again, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God has given us all things that we need for life. Beautiful things. So then, where does the problem lie? Where is the, why is there so much evil in the world? Where does the problem lie? Does it lie with God or does it lie with man? Well, some would emphatically say it lies at the, at the feet of God. But God, of course, proves just the opposite, in a microcosm of the greater perspective that we, we see this with the nation 
of Israel. Because God has not only given all of his marvelous things that we just talked about a few moments ago, but with Israel, he made a special covenant, right? That he would be their God and that they would be his special people. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, he says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a, a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people's on the face of the earth. Does that sound familiar to any of you? It should, because he's made the same covenant and arrangement with the church. The Spirit says through the Apostle Peter, he says that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So by the time of the kings, right, as the Lord led the nation of Israel out of Egypt, across the desert, into the land of Israel, by the time of the kings, this is some 400, 500 years later, God through his prophets has to bring a charge now against his own people. So if you have Isaiah, Mark, turn to Isaiah chapter one, and we're going to skip around in here a little bit, but look at verse two. The Lord says to the prophet, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. And if you flip the page, if you need to, look over at verse 21. You can certainly keep reading. There's a whole bunch of things in there that the Lord mentions. But verse 21, he says, How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water, your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. And so the Lord says now through his prophet, uh, Micah, and just so you know, you know, Micah and Isaiah, they are contemporaries, right? They, they ministered at the same time. Uh, Isaiah was uh, considered a, a, what they call a court uh, preacher, whereas Micah was considered a, a country preacher. So Micah now in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says this, the Lord says this through him, says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and they take them by violence. Also houses and seize them. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Right? And so the Lord, hear, hear me out now, the Lord is proving through the action of Scripture where the breakdown has occurred, that the evil does not lie with God, but it lies with man. So when we talk about racism, as Aubrey said last week, you know, you're not going to find the word racism in the Bible, but you will find the actions and the outworkings of it throughout the entire Bible and throughout all of history. In part, the outworking of racism is what we see here. It is one man oppressing another, and listen, everyone, this is strictly forbidden by God. It is a sin to do so. But now a more descriptive word than racism and a biblically accurate word that believers should use is the word transgression. Why? Because it is a biblical term that keeps us within the biblical framework. The word transgression, just the mention of the word transgression immediately incorporates God's moral law 
and it incorporates God's judgment for those who transgress against his law, oppressing his fellow man. And so here's what I want to say to you. It is wrong for a policeman to abuse his authority. It is wrong for a policeman to have his knee on the back of a, of a man till he cannot breathe and he dies at his hand. It is wrong for him to abuse his authority, for uh, people in their positions to abuse their authority. It should not happen. And this goes for any of us. It is wrong for anyone to abuse our authority. Whether it's an officer, whether it's you, a mom, or a father, it is wrong for a teacher to abuse their authority. It is wrong for a pastor to abuse his authority. It is wrong for a soldier. It is wrong for a business. And here in Micah, we see Israel was oppressing, transgressing their own people by way of abusing their power. They were coveting. They were seizing things violently through violence. They were seizing oper- uh, uh, property. They were oppressing women, as it, as it talks about in Micah chapter 2, verse 9. And so again, part of God's charge in Micah, if you look in verse 3 of chapter 6, he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. Listen, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I set before you leaders. Moses and Aaron and Miriam. So understand, all of this is to show us that it is not God who has broken the agreement. It is man who has broken the agreement. God has given us a beautiful world to live in. And we just can't behave ourselves. You know, I tell you, I, I, I feel this at times, right? As, and, and maybe you do as a parent. You know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden you, you hear this noise coming from the other room and you're like, what is that noise? What is going on? And it's your children about to kill each other. And you're like, would you, look, it doesn't have to be this way. Would you just calm down over there and just, I'm telling you, sometimes I'm, I'm in my office and, you know, we're doing our things and and, you know, we're preparing for, for Sunday and preparing for all these ministries. And all of a sudden we hear a just noise and ruckus and stuff going on in the body. And we're like, what is going on? Would you people just calm down? Just, just, it's okay, right? It, it, and listen, the Lord sits in our hearts. He sits on his throne. But the world cannot behave itself. He's given us a beautiful world to live in. He's made a covenant with us. And God plainly and truthfully lets Israel and subsequently us know this truth. What has the Lord shown us? He has shown us what is good and what he requires of us. So the next thing that we see that he shows us is that we are to do justly. Look at verse 8 again. You, you see the scripture, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly. So the word justly in the original language, it, it simply means judgment. It's the act of deciding a case. But here's the thing. Man cannot, and I'm saying this emphatically, cannot act justly towards another man unless he first acts justly with God. So here's what I'm suggesting to you. Given the greater context of the whole Bible, to do justly, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly. To do justly means two things. Number one, to first and foremost do justly to God. And number two, to do justly to man. This is what the Lord has plainly shown Israel. Right? In regard to do justly to God, it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. This is what he has plainly shown us. If you have Deuteronomy, Mark, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know the scripture. It's a very familiar scripture. He says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. 
the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, right? This should be everything about us. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. That means in all that you do, in all that you do, and you shall, they, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That is in all that you see, in all that you think. God's commandments should be here and in my actions and in my mind and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Understand what he does not say. The Lord does not say, you know, you should, you should have these scriptures but when it comes to your children, just let them grow up and let them decide for themselves when they get to be about 12 or 13 years old. Now he does not say that. He says for us to teach our children diligently. And here's what I want to say to you. Listen, this is our job. This is our job as parents. It is to teach our children God's word diligently. Hear me out now. It is not my job as a pastor to teach your children the word of God. It is your job to teach your children God's word. It is our job here at the church to help you. But it is primarily your job to teach your kids when. Everything and anything. At any moment in any time. Everything is a lesson. Everything in, should incorporate the word of God. Right? When they go out and they're playing with their friends, something goes wrong, they come back, they talk to you about it. It's a, it's a teaching moment where you sit down with them and you share with them the word of God. We should have times of sharing God's word with, with, one, with our children during the week where we're just praying with them, where we're studying with them. Right? We, should, we should strive very hard to make that time. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is the, most, it is, it is the commandment of the Lord for us to do that. Right? It is when they are thinking about where they're going to go in life, when they're thinking about where they're going to go to school, when they're thinking about who they're going to marry, when they're thinking about all of these things. It is our job to help them think biblically, to bring God's word into every and any situation. When we are going to bed at night, when we rise up in the morning, when we're walking anywhere we are, our job is to teach our kids his word. To do justly means, number one, first and foremost, to do justly to God, to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. This is plainly what he has shown Israel, and it's plainly what he has shown us. Remember, Jesus was asked this, really this very question. If you have Matthew 22, Mark, turn to Matthew 22, and look at verse 34. He was asked this question by a lawyer. Actually, look at verse 35. Sorry, 36. He says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? What does Jesus say to him? He says what we just read in Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You understand? That's, that's, that should be us. That should be everything that you and I are about. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So hear me out again. To do justly means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Greatest commandment. Rooted now, not devoid of, but, but created from God's love for us. We now accurately can love our neighbor as ourselves. Understand what Jesus says in verse 40, that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That means God's law, his moral law, specifically his moral commandments. His word to you is his love for you. Remember again, Jesus himself said to his disciples, if you love me, you will what? What does it say? It should be up on the screen. In John 14, if you love me, what does it say? This is the Lord Jesus. Keep my commandments if you love me. The point, we do not determine what love is toward our neighbor. 
God determines it. God determines what love is. To do justly means to love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, so that I can do justly towards my neighbor. To love my neighbor as myself is to act justly toward my neighbor. But understand, it does not mean that you and I get to make up the rules. It does not mean that you and I get to say what's right or to say what's wrong. Only God determines that. Right? This whole values clarification that came in so long ago. It's, it's, it's so antithetical to the word of God. It's just not true. We cannot say, oh, well, that may be right for you, but that's not right for me. We don't play that game. God's word is truth. God's word is right. God's word is accurate. This is what we adhere to. So then, I am not rightly acting justly toward my neighbor if I am not rightly acting justly toward God. This is why the Spirit of God says through the Apostle John, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what, everyone? Say it, say it out loud. He's what? Oh, you chicken. All of you, you're chicken. You don't want to say it. If someone says, I love God, we're going to try this again, and hates his brother, he is? A liar. Very good. Let's put it this way. If I say, I love God and hate my brother, I am a liar. A liar. That's exactly right. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Seen. And look at verse 21. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must also love his brother. We don't make up the rules. We don't get to determine the basis of love for one another. Why is that important? It's so extremely important. It's, it's as Aubrey was saying last week. Because here's what, what's happening. The world is trying to offer us a different basis for loving one another. The world is trying to take this out of the picture and put in its own moral code, and, and it's a problem. One that is not based on God's word, but is very, very antithetical to it. And so here's the thing. The enemy's crafty. He's crafty, right? Right? Understand, he doesn't just come right out and show all, show all of his cards right away. No, what he does is he uses a little bit of truth and he attaches it to raw emotion. And he leads the, the masses astray. And one of the ways that he is doing this right now is through the Black Lives Matter movement. You see, the precious truth is black lives do matter. They do matter. I have no problem saying the name George Floyd. I have no problem saying the name of the nine precious lives that were lost down, downtown Charleston, Mother Emanuel. That is Sharonda Coleman Singleton, who was someone who was helping Tracy and his family with Josh. Cynthia Hurd, Susan Jackson, Ethel Lance, Reverend DePayne Middleton, Reverend, Reverend Clementa Pinckney, Tawanza Sanders, Reverend Daniel Simmons Sr., Myra Thompson. I have no problems saying the name Michael Brown. I have no problems saying the name Trayvon Martin. But I have a huge problem with the Black Lives Matter organization. The Black Lives Matter organization is not just pleading the cause for the black community they are strongly, hear me out now, they are strongly against the word of God as the basis of family structure and practice. And I highly encourage every one of you and everyone listening to go on to their website and to look around. You should go on to their, what they believe and what they're about and the founders and, and read. I have a few excerpts from their website, from their What We Believe page, and it reads like a statement of faith. And understand, there are some very, 
you know, positive things there. But mixed with it are some very, very troubling beliefs. And so here's the first one. They say, we are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women, who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. Hear me out. We have read from God's word. It is wrong to oppress anyone from God's word, right? This is, it is a sin to do so. But you see what the enemy is doing through the language and the crafting of, of, of the paragraph. It is, it is uplifting uh, sinful behavior and, and devoid of God. The next thing they say is, we disrupt the, the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children. Now, obviously, that's a wonderful thing. We should, um, we should care for one another. It's, it's, there's, we should have support for one another. That's the body of Christ. The body of Christ is to be there for one another. It's to be there to support one another in, in difficulty. We are to care for the fatherless. We are to care for the widow. But we are not to disrupt the, the family structure that God has ordained, that God has ordained. The next thing they write is we foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless she or he or they disclose otherwise. Now, most recently, the Black Lives Matter organization has made statements, has made like, like foreign policy statements. And, and guess who they've made them to or against? Any guesses? Israel. They've made them against Israel. They are calling Israel an apartheid state, accusing them of acts of genocide. This is not just a, an organization that is pleading the cause of the black community. There is an agenda in it, and an, an, a, a wicked agenda, and a wicked agenda mixed with it. Hear me out now. There is a reason the Spirit says through the Apostle Paul, if you have Colossians, Mark, turn to Colossians chapter 3. There is a reason that the Spirit says through the Apostle to the church in, in, in Colossae, Look at verse 12. He says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. You understand, if we are cloaked with that, if we are clothed in that, there's no law against us. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. In other words, vengeance does not belong to us. Vengeance belongs to only one, and that is to God. But above all these things, verse 14, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let, that is, you and I must allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts, not to block it, not to stop it, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of God, allow the word of God, the word of Christ to dwell in you. That means all that's here should be in us, should be in our minds. It should permeate our hearts, should permeate everything that we are. Let it dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in, in psalms and hymns. You understand that word admonishing? That's the word in the original language. It's the word nuthesia. It's where we get the word nuthetic from. It's where the whole premise of biblical counseling comes from this. In other words, that we allow the word of God, that we, that we, that we teach 
and we admonish one another. So if I'm struggling with how I'm thinking about a particular thing, and you, I come to you, your job is to use the word of God to help me think through a position, to help me think through how I'm supposed to think about this person, this situation, this individual, this, you know, this circumstance. What does God want me to do? What is God doing in me through this situation, right? That's the whole idea. And vice versa. If you're struggling through something, you can come to me and I can do the same thing. It is my job to do that. It is my responsibility to do that. It is our responsibility. We should allow one another that freedom in each other's lives so that, listen, that you're not walking around with unforgiveness. You're not walking around with hatred. We're not walking around with vengeance in us, but that the peace of God is what we're allowing. So now that we, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And all this to get to this this verse that I want to share with you right here, verse 17. This should be our our mantra. This should be uh, underlined in your Bible. If it's not, I always say, you're in sin. You should underline this Bible, this, this verse. Verse 17. Whatever you do, everyone, whatever you do, in word or in deed, Do all in what name? Only one name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do. That means if you go out and you minister to the homeless, you do it in whose name? You do it in the name of Christ. If you go out to a nursing home, you do it in whose name? You do it in Jesus' name. You love your family and you serve your family, you do that in whose name? You do it in the Lord's name. You don't do that in your name. What is your name? What is our name? It's nothing. There's only one name that is everything, and that's the name of Jesus. We do it in his name. If I'm out, you know, in, in, in um, doing whatever it is that I'm doing, I do it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There is only one name that the, ch- listen, that the church operates under. It is the name of Jesus. There is only one name that can justly convict that can rightly forgive, that can genuinely heal, and it is, listen now, it is the name of Jesus. It is not the organization of Black Lives Matter. And this, is, this truth leads me to my final point of the day. When the Lord says the first and greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You understand this last statement uh, back here in, 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 uh, off of their website that says that they foster a queer-affirming network, that, uh, that uh, they're trying to free themselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual, Do you understand what I'm saying? The basis for us to rightly love one another is to rightly love God and to be able to rightly love our neighbor as ourselves. But here's the last point I want to make. Only when we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength can we rightly love ourselves. God has created us. He is our creator. He has created our souls, our psyche, our spirit, our pneuma. He has programmed us, everyone, to be utterly, completely, 100% fulfilled in another human being? You know the answer, no. In him, in him, Right, we love the people who are in our lives. You know, some of us are, you know, dating and we're thinking of getting married and we just, you know, just love this person that just make me so happy. You know, there's gonna come a time where they're not gonna make you happy. They're gonna make you so annoyed and angry. You know, you just like, you wanna get rid of them. Just like, would you just go away? I don't even wanna see you right now. Because we can never put another person in God's place in our life. Only one person belongs there, and it is God himself. We find fulfillment in him. God is more gratifying than any sexual encounter you will ever have. More freeing. More liberating. 
because he's created us to be 100% completely fulfilled in him. Not in a heterosexual relationship, not in a, a homosexual or lesbian relationship. Spirit says to the apostle in Revelation chapter four, verse 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, if we truly and rightly love God, we would truly and rightly love ourselves, which means the adverse is true. If we hate God, guess what? We hate ourselves. When a person is angry with God or hates God, they're angry at God and they hate God for the way that he has made them. So the question this morning before us is, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? Do you want to be filled with rage? Do you want to be filled with unforgiveness? Do you want to be filled with vengeance? Do you want to be filled with anger or 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 do you want to be free? Do you want to be healed? Listen, this is why Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, the Lord has shown us what is good. He has shown us what is good. We're about to take communion. Listen, this is a powerful reminder of the Lord's way, of all that he has done. He took on the punishment of racism. He took on the punishment of murder. He took on the, the punishment of sexual abuse, of sin. And he paid the debt that I owe. He paid the debt that you owe to a holy God so that we may receive his life-changing grace and be born again. So I always say, you know, the song that What's-Her-Name came out with, you know, is born this way. Right! That's why the Holy Spirit says you need to be born again. Right? We understand that you were born that way. But you and I need to be born again. Jesus says, no one will make it into heaven unless you are born again. Not unto the flesh, but unto the spirit. He has empowered us with his Holy Spirit, giving us the power to live justly first to God and then to each other.